Okay, so the formal analysis is relatively simple to understand. We've just learned about the elements and the principles. And the formal analysis, the, the, the biggest part of it is how we combine those two things to understand the artwork. There are three different things, though, that we add um, to it. So we're going to look at these things um, in this brief lecture. So the first thing that we include in a formal analysis is looking at how the artwork is made. So of course, you can't tell this just by looking um, this is something that you need to do research to be able to explain. Um, and we describe both the medium and the technique used with that medium. So it's not enough to say that it is an oil painting or that um, they're carving in marble. If they do something different or interesting with that, then it should be explained. For instance, did you know that Michael, Michelangelo carved from the front of a block all the way through to the back of the block um, from one direction while he worked on a sculpture? He could visualize um, his sculpture inside of the block and imagined it trapped within the marble, and he was releasing it. Now this is very different than how normal sculptors work. Normally a sculptor works from all four sides, uh, taking out a small portion from one side and then working from the other and the other and the other. Because these materials are very expensive and it's very simple to make a mistake. But Michelangelo didn't need to do that because he could visualize it so clearly. So this is something that you would want to include in the formal analysis because that technique is something that, that you see in the artwork. In fact, he has a handful of um, artworks that are considered unfinished that he called slaves because they were still trapped um, in the marble blocks. The next thing that you do is the things we've been working on for the past few lectures, uh, looking at how the composition comes together. This is where we try to determine the decisions the artist has made in creating the artwork, where we really pay attention to the elements and the principles. And um, the thing that's most important in a composition is how it's organized. So every formal analysis must explain how the composition is balanced and how the composition is unified. So you're explaining how what what creates the harmony in the artwork, what makes it aesthetically appealing, why is it beautiful. The last thing we include in a formal analysis is is we describe an artist's individual style essentially. Um, we explain what makes the artwork innovative. Um, we value that more than anything else in the art world. And if you are having trouble understanding why, let me explain it like this. If we had a, an artist today that uh, was an amazing craftsman, could sculpt incredible sculptures, but all they did was copy Michelangelo. They're only remaking Michelangelo sculptures that already exist in the world would you be interested in seeing their artwork? Or would you just rather see Michelangelo sculptures, the originals? You know, there, there is a reason why we make a big deal out of fakes and fraudulent artworks. Because if all you can do is copy someone's work, it's not interesting. You know, there's, there's somebody's job in the world to make up new words and add them to the dictionary. At one point in time, I, I thought that that was my dream job. I used to love um, 
reading the dictionary and I I dreamed of the day that I could could actually make up new words that other people would use not just me and uh, the thing that I thought was the most interesting about the art language is that we essentially kind of have a dictionary too but it's it's more of an encyclopedia I suppose but it's of the visual it's a visual encyclopedia it's a visual language so artists if they want to be something in the art world have to expand that visual language they need to do something new and interesting um, that hasn't been done before or they're combining old things in a new way and and in that way they're expanding kind of that visual encyclopedia um, because that's what makes things interesting that um, is, a, is a new thing that we want to see in that concept of innovation is why things like taping a banana to a wall starts to have value it seems irrelevant it doesn't make a lot of sense I get it but it is kind of pushing the envelope to a new place. And we will get to a point in class where we start to discuss these kind of concepts of contemporary um, art and contemporary ideas that really push the envelope past um, aesthetics and beauty and more towards concepts um, to help you understand really crazy things like that. But it has to do with these new ideas, these new concepts that give it value. There's more than one way to discuss an innovative style that an artist has. And you'll know how to discuss it in a paper because it's the way that it's discussed in the research you do. Um, either the research will just talk about what makes that individual artist unique, and that's how you'll end up discussing it. Or they'll discuss the artist in a group of individuals um, who came up with ideas together. And as they came up with those ideas together, you will be able to see um, similarities and differences in how they arrived at um, the concepts. So. I have examples of all of this, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at that now. So I know I used Michelangelo as an example, but now we're going to look at um, Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night. So again, how is the artwork made? Discussing the medium and the technique. So this is an oil painting, um, but the oil paint doesn't describe enough because oil paint can be applied in a multitude of ways. So the texture can be different. And it really comes down to the texture. That's why we put it in the visual analysis, because texture is one of the elements. Um, Van Gogh was known for using the impasto technique. Impasto uh, uses a wax-based medium mixed into the paint. Impasto is actually an Italian word for mixture. And it's used to describe a painting technique where the paint is thickly laid on the surface so that brush strokes or palette knife marks are visible. Now, since you haven't painted before, um, those a few of you might have, um, that makes some sense to you but doesn't give you great context. So let me give you some extra. There's a difference between a cupcake that has been frosted with a butter knife and a cupcake that has been frosted with a spatula that becomes super smooth and perfect. The, the butter knife, you know, it gets a bunch of tiny little ridges in it and it's really thick and built up. So paint that has the wax-based medium mixed into it with that impasto technique is a very similar texture to cake frosting. And when you use a, a paintbrush with it, you're gonna get nice thick ridges the way that Van Gogh has here 
that are going to look very similar to the top of a cupcake if you've used a butter knife um, with those thin little ridges. So you can kind of imagine, especially because he's done the swirls, what this would look like if you were able to look at it from the side and see kind of the three-dimensional aspect of the texture. Though the impasto technique can also have um, a bit of a smoother texture if you use a palette knife because you can lay it out very similar to a spatula. It doesn't mean that there won't be thicker areas because as you know the cupcake um, with the spatula will still have thicker areas but there will also be areas where it looks a lot smoother. So it just kind of helps you understand you know the technique includes both the impasto but he also used the paintbrush to apply it. Um, whereas another artist that uses impasto might use a palette knife and the texture would be completely different. So this is why we include the medium and the technique in the visual analysis because it affects the actual texture of the artwork and it helps the, the reader of your paper understand um, really what the, the artwork looks like when they can only see an image of it. Um, so the next part is looking at how the composition comes together. And this is again where we try to determine the decisions the artist has made in creating the artwork. So I've already kind of written this up to um, maximize time. And of course, like any of my other lectures, uh, this document is available for you. So you can just download it um, in the, the um, module. But here, uh, in terms of space, the body of the nude of the old Alesque takes up the entire frame of the canvas. Her head, elbow, and buttocks are inches away from the edge of the canvas, which adds to the sensuality of the artwork and highlights the focus on her. Um, Ingrid's use of color is carefully planned. Her skin um, has an a little bit of extra orange. Um, a Caucasian skin tone is made by mixing white and orange together, so it can often have a little bit of orange in it, but usually you don't actually notice the orange in a Caucasian skin tone. He's certainly added extra to highlight this complementary color scheme here. Um, so her skin in the orange silk of the sheets is complemented by the blue of the pillows and the divan she's laying on, as well as um, the, the blue patterned curtain to her right. This careful setup of color helps to harmonize the composition and unify the painting through a complementary color scheme, utilizing contrast. Because complementary colors create contrast. The foreground here, as you kind of notice, remains unlit, bringing attention to the long sensuous body of the odalesque. It seems as if there's kind of a spotlight on her, right? Like her skin just seems like it, it, it's brightly lit, whereas nothing else in the artwork does, except maybe there is a bit of a sheen on the um, curtain here. Um, it seems a spotlight has been cast directly on her body, specifically lighting and drawing attention to the way he uses proportion by elongating her back and pelvis area. Um, if you remember, this artwork was used um, to help you understand abstract style better, because though there are some things in the artwork that look realistic, um, the, the use of abstract proportions, those elongated proportions in the body does make this artwork abstract. We're also drawn into her eyes because she addresses us. She's looking right at us. And the dark shadow behind her helps to create contrast um, against her light skin. This helps to solidify the emphasis. Then her right arm works as a directional line that leads your attention to the right and over to that ornate silk curtain with its decorative pattern. This path from one point of emphasis to another creates rhythm. 
Ingray used tight brushwork to capture the likeness of the implied textures of the model's skin, the silk of the divan, and the satin curtain. The peacock feathers and the old Alesk's fan look silky soft and iridescent like the real thing. The folds of the fabric she lies on, as well as the folds in the curtain, give a realistic appearance to them. This variety in textures uh, provides visual interest in the artwork, making the work more appealing. The way these textures are all painted in a realistic way makes them look like they belong together, creating unity in the artwork. So it's not the variety of the textures, but the way that he's using um, a, a realistic implied texture on each of them that's creating the unity, that makes them look like they all belong in the same painting. The artwork has an asymmetrical balance with more weight on the left due to her body, and Ingray has maintained balance through the brightly colored and patterned curtain on the right. The visual balance in the work helps to create harmony in the painting. Now sometimes unity, um, you know, we just have to reinforce that all artworks need to discuss unity and balance, right? And unity is one of those things that sometimes students have a really hard time um, understanding. And so I use this artwork by Turner to, um, to really help you understand how to arrive at unity. So as you remember, unity can be discussed in a variety of ways. Unity means harmony. What makes the artwork visually pleasing? What makes it aesthetically appealing? What makes it seem beautiful? Um, wholeness, a coherent whole, is like what makes it feel complete? If taken out of the artwork, what would make the artwork feel like it was lacking something? Togetherness. What has the artist done to bring things together in the artwork? What looks like they be things belong together? In a sense of oneness. So, you know, these are the different concepts. You can answer these questions in terms of subject matter. So, to answer those questions, you know, usually students say things like the sky, the boats, the reflections on the water, and the sun setting. Those are the big answers that are common for this artwork. So we start with the subject matter. Um, those are the things you can't take your eyes off of that, that really complete the artwork, that, that really pull the artwork together. So let's take those and try to figure out which elements and principles are used to create these things. So let's start with the sky. Which elements are most present in that sky? The first one I see is the texture of those clouds because that is the first thing I'm drawn to. I am drawn to the way the, the clouds are, are painted. The second thing I'm drawn to is that sunset in the sky, those colors. And I notice that in the sky, there's an analogous color scheme because there are the warm colors that are there. However, if I look carefully throughout the artwork, I do notice that the key color here would be blue. So let me just give you a chance to kind of see that. There's red, there's red orange, there's yellow, there's yellow-orange, um, and yellow. But none of those colors are as predominant as the color blue. So that tells us that the color scheme has to include blue.
And because of that, um, and this is not like a, a proper um, red-orange. This is, is much more of a darker red. So there's not a whole lot of uh, red-orange in the work. It's much more appropriate that this is a complementary color scheme um, with uh, the, the added sophistication of the analogous colors in the sky. And that's how I would explain the color that certainly creates unity. Um, but the way that Turner has used texture in the sky to create harmony um, makes the artwork really aesthetically appealing. The next thing, let's look at the boats, because <clears throat> this is a big answer. The white boat next to the dark brown boat. Um, so we have a light value next to a dark value, which is really interesting. Um, there's certainly some emphasis on them, right? Our attention is drawn to them. Um, but contrast is being used there to bring them together and to create emphasis there. So in terms of togetherness, what, what brings this together, what kind of completes the artwork? Um, because I think that the artwork would feel really empty without those boats. Um, and I think that you would agree if you kind of imagined this, the sunset really completes the work, but the artwork would feel really empty without something big on the, the, the left side there. So um, those boats and the way that he's using contrast to create emphasis really brings the work together. The sunset also uses contrast to create emphasis. So you can kind of understand, again, that just kind of reinforces that um, description that we just did, how he uses contrast to create emphasis, and that really brings the work together. What about the reflections on the water? Those are just really beautiful, right? It draws the sky down into the water. That repetition of color is really nice. Um, and, it, and it creates beauty. Again, harmony is one of the definitions of unity. So, so it, it adds to the beauty of the artwork. And that is a definition of unity. That is enough. Now the setting sun becomes the focal point. And the boats are the other point of emphasis. Um, and in this, I think that what, um, what really is kind of important to, to see and to note is that this isn't that difficult, right? You can start with the subject matter and really just think of the different definitions of unity and find one of them that fits for the, the, um, the subject matter that you're really drawn to in the artwork. Um, again, this artwork is, is asymmetrically balanced. There is certainly more weight on the left because of those two boats. They, they are heavier um, than the right-hand side, though um, Turner does maintain balance by using those bright, warm colors. Notice that on the left-hand side behind the boats, uh, you know, it is an in the water around them. He's using cool colors, and then he's using the warmer colors in the sky and water on the right to maintain the balance because visually that, that um, adds more weight. And the last thing that um, 
we discuss in the visual analysis is essentially the artwork's individual style. What makes the artwork unique? So on the left here we have Gustav Klimt's The Kiss. This is a part of Gustav Klimt's golden period. Now this is not a, a period of time um, that you would describe that many artworks were created um, for a lot of people. This is just simply a time period where Gustav Klimt was making one artwork after another utilizing real gold in the artwork along with silver and platinum. So actual metal is in this work. He used so much of it so extensively that they, they named it his golden period. Um, gold had been used throughout for, for centuries, you know, back to the Egyptians and even earlier, um, in artwork, but not in the way that he used it. So it was very interesting um, how he developed the style. And if you researched him, it would talk about him individually. So you would know that, that comparing what he does to someone else wouldn't be relevant. On the right, we have two Impressionists. Now, the Impressionists were a group of people that got together almost every night. Um, they met at the bar, they had drinks, they talked about their ideas and concepts in the art world. They were renegades. They were rebels who rejected the traditional... Um, contemporary concepts in the art world. Um, they rejected realism um, and were more interested in capturing an impression of their subject, which is where the, t the term impressionism comes from. They were interested in how light falls over a subject um, and in a few other things that were more individualized. For instance, uh, Monet, as you can see in the top, was very interested in natural light. Um, and he would study one subject over an extensive period of time, uh, studying, you know, going there at different times of day, um, at different seasons throughout the year, so he could study how light affected that one particular place all year round, all day long. Um, whereas Degas, you notice on the bottom, um, he is most known for uh, painting um, the ballet and ballet dancers. Um, and he um, had a very different kind of hand. But you will notice that the way that they captured a subject very quickly, the way that they used colors, um, was very similar. And so if you were going to write... Um, a paper on an Impressionist, you couldn't talk about the Impressionist's ideas um, uniquely and individually like Monet came up with them because he didn't. Um, the group did. And so as you discuss them, it would be important to give the group credit. And so that's where it would be appropriate to compare and contrast how different artists um, achieved the same goals. So those are the things that are included in a formal analysis. Um, the, what you do uh, usually is make a list of the elements and make a list of the principles and just observe the artwork and write down the elements and the principles that you see within it so that um, you don't miss one that, that seems to be quite important. 